So we just like to, um, we, we love our role and we love traveling to New Zealand the most years to visit our partners and uh, we love hearing their stories. And so we hope that you love hearing their stories too. So, but um, just give you a few of the overview bits first with the, um, uh, to talk about microfinance. Um, Uganda, we have, um, basically we have five partnerships at the moment, a couple more in development, um, and uh, in, in bed in those partnerships, there are, they, there are several, I guess we like call for projects there, there are, there are seven uh, microfinance schemes running there, um, that some, some, and some of those break down further into some groups as well. Uh, we have about 300 uh, individual beneficiaries uh, in each of the loan schemes. That's a, that's, a, that's a rough head count that I went through the numbers that we got last year, but that always it's a movable fee that will definitely be more when we go back this year. Um, we, we are excited to see some of the growth and development in this area. Um, typically, typically our global studies show that um, each micro each loan beneficiary will benefit approximately, the ripple on benefit is about 10 other people. When I look at Africa and the size of families, I think that, that's got to be bigger than that because I mean, even when you're talking to individuals, they're talking about six children and two or three orphans in their family networks, and that's even before those who are employing other people. So the, the ripple on benefit's got to be bigger than that, in my opinion, but maybe there are, there are large population growths in the moment. Um, the initial loan size, which basically the entry level loans are between 50 and 70 US dollars, that translates to between 150,000 and 200,000, no, 50, yeah, shillings. <laughs> I think I've got that right. Ugandan shillings. Ugandan shillings, yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, so, in the loan sizes, the loan size it seems ridiculously small, but it's just transformational for some of these people that you'll hear. Um, interestingly, one of one of our partners in Lira, who you'll hear more about, we, we went back last year to realise that sort of year on year the loan size and the subgroups had doubled, and we had really no input. We'll talk about that again. Uh, it just happened. Um, and some of the schemes we're starting to sort of identify are either self-generating or plateauing as well in terms of level of support, and that raises some questions for us as to how to manage that part of the process as well. And it's also fantastic, the, 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 the biggest part of sustainability, which we'll as we talk about some stories briefly, uh, is to see emerging leadership. And um, certainly in two of the main cities, Lira and Mbale, and with one of our key leaders, she, she's clicked that she needs to have people that work under her and uh, are pulling through new leadership as well. So we're going to introduce you to some of those people. Um, I, I think, feel like it's a real privilege. I uh, really appreciate the, the chance, just like Emma was saying, to talk with you guys into just the little conversations because I recognise I, I feel really privileged because a lot of the people that um, fund the, the projects um, and the partnerships don't get to sit down and See it on the ground, and um, I, I, I really, I've heard somebody say it before, but I really wish I had some way of kind of giving that to each person that contributes financially, because it's it's so amazing to see what happens on the ground, and um, I'm really um, excited about how this is a focus on sustainability, um, and this picture here. Is, is a very strong picture of sustainability in a whole lot of levels. So I'll just talk briefly to it. The person in the centre is Anna, and Bright Hope has been in relationship with Anna for a long, long time. A long time, very long. Well, I should know. 2003. Okay. Um, Anna. At the moment, is overseeing eight um, microloan groups that involve 120 women, and for that to be sustainable, Anna's 
Mm, she's not getting any younger, just like all of us. And she's also got significant health problems. Her um, husband's employment has been, become a lot more um, inconsistent. And so she's just one person in here. So for this to be sustainable, um, we've been talking with her about bringing in new leadership. The structure of the microloan groups that um, she runs are always in, in one level sustainable because there is a, um, the groups have a leader who then comes in and, and she oversees a lot of what happens. But there's been a significant challenge with the leadership and as we've gone in previous years she's, she's really tried and it hasn't always succeeded. But um, the lady on the right is Grace Mann. And up in Lera, we visited last year, and originally there was two groups up there, there's now four. And this was, these two groups were seated, basically Anna um, ministers to a lot of women, she speaks uh, at conferences with women, and from speaking at Corombe Pentecostal Church up in Mira, two new, they caught the vision. And from there, two new groups were formed, and there are two leaders that are very solid people in the community. And so Grace is one of those women. She has her own microloan. She supports her own family. She's a very engaged person in the local church and she coordinates uh, one of these new microloan groups. The lady on the right is Jackie. Um, I'll just get my hands Jackie. <laughs> Jackie is a 26-year-old um, young woman who found herself very destitute. She had a, a, a baby, uh, uh, was pretty isolated, um, was really struggling. She was one of the early people that was brought into the, the new micro and she's now got a little business, um, she's got a small loan to start with, business with, with uh, fire, what's it called? Uh, charcoal, charcoal stoves, as well as recycling bottles. And from this business, she's now ready, she's, she's got the first loan, she's almost paid it back, she's ready to get another loan to keep her business going. She's supporting her grandmother and her baby, and what Grace was talking about in terms of sustainability is that she doesn't only have the financial resources to support her grandmother, herself, and her baby. She has a network of women that she relates with who are her social network who will support her if for some reason she gets really sick or or the market has a fire and something happens to her stop. They are collaboratively supporting each other and they depend, they're interdependent on each other and that's sustainability. <laughs> so there's that, um, that's, that, that level of sustainability in the relationship as well as the connection to the bigger uh, body of Christ as well. And then it's Just a, an overview. Um, Anna oversees microloan projects in, in Bali and Mira. And this is just to give you a little bit of an example. Uh, this lady um, has, is in a new group and she collects firewood. A lot of um, they are encouraging diversification, so not to rely on one level of income, and that's also another factor of our society. This is a concert, she's 77 years old and she's now, she's in a new loan running um, just a little stall and she runs a garden job <laughs> and sells her produce at that as well. So she does a little bit of buying and selling as well as her garden. Uh, there's a lot of graces in Uganda, so the lady on the right is Grace. She was a woman who had a successful business with her husband and um, 
basically he died. She became very unwell physically. She needed surgery and had to wait for a very long time. She put it work. <coughs> basically she lost everything. And um, she's come up into one of these groups and is now buying and selling grain. Okay. And um, doing really well because she has that, all that history and experience and that she's actually contributing a lot to the other woman in her group as well. This is Ida. Uh, Ida, for a long time, has been sewing and, and a part of a loan group. Um, but basically, in terms of diversification, Ida decided that uh, she was going to save to buy a cow that would be pregnant so that she could start producing milk and diversifying her income. Because sewing wasn't all that, at least peaks and troughs with that in the place she was living. But effectively, the cow was just about to give birth, and it was stolen. So when we visited Ida, she didn't tell us that. You know, it was Anna that told us that. But that Ida is a part of a group of women. So that is sustainability in the sense that because they are connected in the, the, they are able to hold each other through those financial and kind of personal challenges in life. Um, and thank you. And we, um, and, and just following on from that, I think I, I, I would just speak for myself. I found some of the some of the most moving experiences of my life with the, these particular groups, experiencing them, the, the level of support they give one another, the level of care, the praise and worship that they have together. These are groups that they're not all Christian women. There are many of them are Muslim women. They get they hear the gospel. The second year that we went back to one of the groups in Mbale, many of the Muslim women have become Christian. Uh, back that we actually asked where the Muslim women were, they said, oh, most of them have become Christian. Really, that's, that was actually what Anna had said. Um, but the, the, the level of mutual support is very moving, and to be in a group of people that are involved in praise and worship and singing, it just, it, it just does something. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it show, the level of support. And one, of the, one of the things that Anna does superbly with the microloans and that helps the sustainability is bring those groups together. A lot of microloan schemes, they don't meet as groups, but these ones do. And, that, and that, I think that adds a huge strength. Um, this woman here, it's Sarah Mizaki. She she was the other emerging leader that we met last year. And for these schemes to succeed, they need good leadership. Sarah has a, a diploma in business administration. She lives in Mbale, which is the other city that Anna, she, she's achieved a, a bus commuter. It's about a five hour, a six hour ride between the two cities. Um, she, she is very active in her community. So the woman to the right of her, it was, it's, her name is Lafisa. She, she was her neighbour, but she was a lady in extreme poverty, like, like right, right at the very bottom of the heap. Like six children, all of them sick, she's HIV positive. Um, when we met her last year, she looks glum because she's got typhoid. I mean, I think, we'll see. Um, and, um, and, when, and she was Sarah's neighbour, and Sarah uh, really felt very sorry for her. And, um, but, that, but her and Anna both thought that, that this woman, she was too far down the bottom of the heap to really benefit from alone, and, um, and too sick, and even though they were supporting her in other ways, they didn't want to bring her to the scheme, but they took the risk, and she now has a little stall, and she's now able to make enough money to support herself and her family, which is a pretty cool story, isn't it? It's a pretty important story, really, because that, that story gets repeated hundreds of times just in Uganda and across Black Plug we've got lots of other micro schemes. So, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, sustainability, um, I'd just like to talk briefly about a, another partnership down in Drew and Jury. Um, basically this partnership happened because um, Reuben and Justice are brothers and um, ministering in their own church and community and in the, the, the region, you know, uh, Christian ministry. And the initial idea was the, um, what you, is that bivocational? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's a new word for me. Um, uh, the 
that original idea was to help them to have income to support their ministry. Okay. So that seems like a really lovely, simple idea, except what happened, <laughs> which is really exciting, because this did not come from Bright Hope, is that nearby there was a very, very poor community where most, if not, well, yeah, pretty much many, all the children would not attend school. There was a lot of uh, social disruption with uh, poverty, alcoholism, lack of employment, huge, huge problems. And so these brothers, they did start to develop their own income streams, but as they were doing that, they also started to seed the pro put the profits from that into this community. And, um, so, and this didn't happen through Bright Hope's ideas, this happened <coughs> through their passion to reach out to their, their community. And so in, initially it started with the cow project, to, to, to tell me if I can get this wrong, and um, that's, the herd is now at a level where Bright Hope doesn't give any more money into that. Um, the latest thing with that is that they have asked for a loan to buy a milk cooler so that it can become more profitable. Okay. But that doesn't, that is seeding effectively at school, um, as well as many other kind of ministries in that area. Uh, so there's the cow project. Um, Reuben is there with his chainsaw. So um, basically he was already had a chainsaw business um, that was funded by his extended family as well as the ministry. But basically uh, it was it got to the point where it just couldn't work anymore. He had to he hadn't had the business knowledge about saving to sustain his own business. And so Bright Hope effectively helped with that and that's so he does milling and um, uh, cutting down trees and milling, and that's a, a significant income into this uh, partnership and the ministries they run. And of course, foundations for farming, they're, they're really keen on picking that up. And this year, um, John and Phil and Matt will be going down there, and they're, they're going to be running uh, a foundations for farming training because we went ran one last year and they brought up a number of people who were really um, uh, passionate and significantly uh, people who could impact in their community. So the, um, the next slide just shows the other part of the, the sustainability chain because really what, what Bright Hope did not have involvement in but sort of happened was uh, Marumba Christian School, which is the school in the poor community. That's, they are a various number of photos of, of it with Ruben and Justice standing here. The, the light's not that great to see their smiling faces, but um, they are very proud of that and they should justifiably because it's, a, it's actually a very well-run school that started, and neither of these guys have got an education background. They are sharp cookies, especially, uh, especially Justice, the younger. He has problems sometimes because Reuben is about 12 years older than him and he has to defeat his older brother, but in reality he probably, he's got a lot more of the, the street smarts really, he's a high, he's a very onto it guy. But the, the, the income that, that the, the plan was originally to support them in their ministry, but the reality is that it works a lot better when the income goes into communities, and you can flip to the next slide. Uh, when the income goes, and the reason for that is that there are a number of issues that we don't really experience that they have, and, they're, and, and one of them, one of the big issues that they have in this culture is jealousy, if people do well. I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a more of a violent tall poppy syndrome than perhaps we get in New Zealand, but it's, you know, that, that, that crops will get destroyed or animals will get killed or 
all sorts of things. So actually the income, and they identified that it was better to divert the income back into the school and help the school to, to develop. And so um, the chainsaw business particularly, there's, quite a, there's been quite a spectacular income from the chainsaw business and all of it has gone to help the school which is about to relocate to a new premise. It's gone to pay the deposit on the new buildings. We are not, uh, I put the K with you, Bright Hope does not support buildings. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, and so we're not involved in that part of the process, but that's what the income has gone gone to do. And the trouble is, <coughs> Ruben at the moment is not able to do that because he's got, um, he's been sick for the last few months, which is a real shame. <coughs> But income generation does, we, we are identifying that it really helps to benefit communities. And often in this situation here, it's way better that it benefits the community. Um, the milk cooler, the milk cooler is a really interesting one too because the money, the money we, we worked through the process last year and the money went across in November to buy a, buy a milk cooler. But it's really interesting how business works. I mean, the, the, Uganda has just had an election and it, Every email that we've had in the last few months has identified that the election has crippled the country, really, and uh, it's only just probably getting through that stage. So they haven't even been able to buy the milk cooler, and the reason they haven't been able to buy the milk cooler is because the import has left the country. All of the Asian, the Indian, and Chinese people that were operating the import business has left the country because they were so uh, scared about what would happen during the election, probably with some justification if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that hasn't, and so, so the, the situation hasn't necessarily fully stabilised yet, so that's got, I watch the space on it at the moment. But they've done their sums, and I'm really, I, I think we've looked at it, and we're really confident that this is, this is a, a really good next step, because there is a growing demand for good quality milk products, even in a, a warm climate, the most important part of that is uh, to make sure it gets, it's kept cool. And the other thing that I just wanted to say, just in finishing, is that if we're talking about sustainability, Ruben and Justice get, get there. Bright Hope's not supporting the school at the moment. Um, they're, 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 they're managing the school fees in a way in a very poor community. That plus the income from the milk and um, other income sources, which we never quite figure out really, because we, don't, we only we skate across the surface in a couple of days each time. But, but the school, the school is managing itself. The school is now re reasonably self-sustaining. Hmm? Yes, sure. okay. yeah. Just to finish, I think what, uh, in terms of some of the things <coughs> that Fraser was talking about last night, um, you know, we, we go off and we visit, and what we see is our partners <coughs> making decisions getting plans, um, moving in the year in ways that sometimes we would never have understood or made sense of. And um, one of the things that we did last year that was ex for me an extremely powerful experience was when we came together for the Foundations of Farming, all our partners came into one room at the end and seeing our partners who live in the country, this is their home, this is their land, this is their country, talking together and us just sitting in a way to the side was the most powerful experience I've ever had there in a way. It's because, and so I kind of get what you're saying there, Fraser, it's actually so much theirs. And what they said to each other, and what they talked about, what they explained to each other, was so much more than we could do in a hundred years. Because they understand it deeply. They understand it incredibly. Because they live it. So thank you. Thanks guys.